Hi, I'm Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story, the podcast that'll help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. Brought to you by the world's most industrious storyteller, me. You know, I've been bringing you this show for nearly six years. I've got over 300 episodes, and I'd love to hear what you think of it, or if there's a story topic that I have not yet covered that you would like me to. Just email me your comments to park at businessofstory.com. Would love to hear from you. Today's story marketing moment is the ideal lead-in to this week's guest. But let's go back to this past Easter weekend. Michelle and I spent it in the rubble of Hakumba Hot Springs, hunting Easter eggs with our grandson. Last fall, our daughter Corbin and her business partners purchased what amounts to Schitt's Creek on the border in East San Diego County. Hakumba Hot Springs used to be a popular playground for everyone from Hollywood stars to families traveling on Old Highway 8 that connected Southern Southern California with the rest of the country. Currently, they're renovating the hotel, restaurant, and bar inspired by Moroccan retreats. They're also turning an old filling station into a coffee shop and will refurbish Main Street. It's going to be beautiful as they reclaim a hopping stop on Highway 80 before Interstate 8 bypass the town. They'll be reopening this July so you can check it out. Their work reminds me of what Stephanie Stuckey is doing with her family's brand. You see, her interstate was a big corporation that bought Stuckey's and paved over the family brand, bypassing its heritage that made it a special road trip stop in the first place. She bought it back and is renovating the company by resurrecting her granddad's original logo, freshening the packaging, and sharing origin stories. I just love reading her LinkedIn posts every morning because they're such great examples of brand storytelling. The lesson you'll learn today is that if you feel like your brand has grown stale, look to its past and dust off the story that made it special in the first place. I can help you do just that in my new book, Brand Bewitchery. Grab a copy of it on Apple Books and Amazon. I am so delighted to host the CEO of Stuckey's, Stephanie Stuckey, for you today on The Business of Story. My first three months of running Stuckey's, I spent every evening poring over articles about my grandfather and writing them down and condensing them and putting them in a timeline. And there was, he came back to life for me. I was 12 when he died. And there are all these great things about him that I never knew. And I think They don't need to die in an archive in a box somewhere. They need to be shared. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Stuckey's, it is the roadside oasis famous for its pecan log rolls. The company was founded by Stephanie's grandfather, W.S. Stuckey Sr., as a pecan stand in Eastman, Georgia in 1937 and grew into over 350 stores by the 1970s. The company was sold in 1964, but is now back in family hands and poised for a comeback. Stephanie took over in November of 2019, and under her leadership, Stuckey's has purchased a healthy pecan snack company, undergone a rebranding, added three new franchise stores, expanded its B2B retail customer base, increased online sales 550% with a new website, and will soon acquire a pecan processing and candy manufacturing plant. Stephanie received both her undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Georgia. She has worked as a trial lawyer, elected to seven terms as a state representative, ran an environmental nonprofit law firm that settled the largest Clean Water Act case in Georgia history, served as Director of Sustainability and Resilience for the City of Atlanta, and taught as an adjunct professor at the University of Georgia School of Law. She was named one of the 100 most influential Georgians by Georgia Trend Magazine and is a graduate of Leadership Atlanta. Stephanie also serves on many nonprofit boards, including the National Sierra Club Foundation, Earth Share of Georgia, and her local zoning review board. Before the show, she wrote me this little story. Shortly after taking over Stuckey's, I came upon an abandoned Stuckey's on the side of the road in rural Alabama. 
it just reminded me how daunting a task I have before me. So many people think of us as a has-been brand. I posted a photo of that dilapidated store and talked about how I was determined to rebuild my grandfather's company. That post got thousands of likes and comments on LinkedIn within a day, and today, several months later, has over 1 million views. That gave me the encouragement to plunge forward in my efforts and reminded me that I'm not alone. Please welcome to the Business of Story, Stephanie Stuckey. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I didn't know about Stuckey's until I started following you on LinkedIn about six months ago, and I started reading your stories about the family business and it being sold, and then your dad buying it back, and then you taking over after quite a you know nice career in law and other things, and then the way you told the stories and all the archival photos you showed of your family business, I just was amazed. I started following you, invited a cu- you a couple times onto the show, and then the magical post happened. It was when you were in Quartzsite, Arizona, and you were visiting the store out there. And I had mentioned to my wife, Michelle, I said, dang, I'm trying to get the CEO of Stuckey's on the business of story. And she goes, Stuckey's? We used to stop there all the time on our way from Phoenix over to California because her mother loved your date shakes. So it's the date shakes in Quartzsite, Arizona that finally got us connected. Welcome. So glad you're here. Thank you. And I love that story because that's what Stuckey's is all about is road trips and telling memories of special places that we went on trips. And so that's what I'm sharing on LinkedIn. It's a really fascinating journey. I think unlike a lot of nostalgic brands that are run by third generation family members, our story is unique in that we fell out of family hands for decades and we got the company back, which so rarely happens. And I'm turning it around. So I think the comeback story is really the greatest American story. It's it's uniquely a story that Americans latch onto. We all want to root for the underdog. And so that's what I've been inviting people into is be part of my journey, root us on and help us on and engage with us as we try to build this brand back. So for all those listeners that are not familiar with Stuckey's, what is it exactly? We're a roadside oasis and have been since 1937. We were founded in Eastman, Georgia as a pecan stand on Highway 1 in the midst of the Depression. My grandfather started selling pecans to make ends meet as a side hustle. And I love that he started Stuckey's as a side hustle because it really epitomizes what entrepreneurship is all about, just rolling up your sleeves and doing whatever it takes to make ends meet. And then he realized sitting on the side of the road in the hot South Georgia sun that he really needed to have a better life. And had this vision of, I'm going to start offering travelers something special. And that's what any business does that's successful is you give someone what they want. You're solving a problem. What is a problem that motorists have? They want a cold drink. They want a snack. They want gas. And so that's what he started offering. And he really was the beginning. He was the beginning of the American road trip. He started roadside retail that has evolved from those humble beginnings. But at our peak, we had 368 stores in 42 states. I'm sorry, those of y'all in the Pacific Northwest missed out. (laughs) We did have one location uh, in Washington State, but we, we really were a brand that was centered in the Southeast and then the Midwest. But we went as far as the Jersey Turnpike and the Pennsylvania Turnpike. We were featured in the movie The Irishman for one of our locations that used to be up that way. So we had a pretty far reach. And and anyone who road tripped in the 60s and 70s a lot and pulled over, they would likely have a memory of Stuckey's. So that's, that's sort of who we were and who we are moving forward is I am rebuilding this brand by focusing on what we can do to turn the company around. And that is selling our product and telling the story of the road trip 
we we can get into this more, but we don't have any corporate owned stores and we only have 20 brick and mortar stores left. So I'm limited under our current structure and given our finances, what I can do with the stores, but the pecan side of the business and the candy and the novelty side is booming. We just bought a manufacturing facility. We've got lots going on and we're profitable for the first time in years. And so we're turning it around and it's happening. So you've got 20 brick and mortar stores, but you have increased online sales by 550%. And of course, in this day and age of online everything, and especially given COVID, that that must have been, I mean, a, a real boon for your business that you weren't relying on all those uh, roadside stores during the last, well, 12 months. Yeah, the online sales really have helped us weather the tough times. Plus, I'll be honest, the PPP and the government aid was definitely appreciated. And we pivoted in how we generate revenue and we started partnering with more retail partners. And that's what has restored us to profitability more than anything is getting Stucky's product in places like Ace Hardware and general stores. We are in Dollywood, which I absolutely love because I'm a huge Dolly Parton fan. So the online sales, even though they've increased, 530% was for Q4. Overall, last year was 430%. Those are still really strong numbers and better than the national average increase, which was about 30%. So those are strong numbers, but overall, our online sales were only 10% of our revenue, but that went up from being 1% of our revenue. So the percentage increase is really solid and continues to grow. So was Stuckey's in your family when you were born? I know it was sold in 1964, not to date you, but did you grow up as a family business or just kind of the history of it until your dad bought it back? I did not grow up in the business. I was born at the the last week of 1965. So my grandfather sold Stuckey's the year before I was born. And I actually look upon it as an advantage because you hear all these stories about family businesses and the stats bear this out that the third generation is often the generation where it dramatically drops off and you lose the family business. And there's a myriad of factors, but There's the stereotype that does hold true in some cases that the third generation is the generation that had the trust fund and the dividend checks. And so they grew up and became artists and poets and musicians, all wonderful professions, but not necessarily continuing a family business. So I didn't grow up with that. And I didn't have the sense of entitlement or one day this pecan log roll kingdom. For those of you who know Stuckey's, we're best known for our pecan log roll, which is a candy confection. It's nougat rolled in pecans and caramel, and it's absolutely delicious. So I didn't have the sense of one day this pecan log roll empire with air quotes (laughs) will be mine. (laughs) And it, it made me really fight for it. And I didn't, I didn't inherit this. I bought the company with my life savings post age 50 after a full career with a completely different career trajectory. So it it was a different journey. And I think I'm a better CEO because of it. Well, and let's talk about that because that fascinated me as well. So you've got your law degree, did a lot of work there. You were a state representative, uh, did a lot of work in environmental nonprofit law. You were the Director of Sustainability and Resilience for the City of Atlanta, which is a a very, very big job. And you and I have a mutual friend in Tim Trefser, who's the Director of Sustainability and CSR over at the Georgia World Congress Center. He was one of my students, Tim was, at, at ASU when I was teaching storytelling in the Executive Masters for Sustainability Leadership. So I know what goes into those roles, and they are completely different than what you are doing now. What was it? that made you want to leave a very successful career and roll the dice and buy the family business back? Well, it's my family, right? And it's my name up on those billboards. And even though it had fallen out of family hands, actually, it was my father who got the company back in the mid-1980s. He at the time was running several other businesses, and he was able to get Stuckey's back in the family and continued the stores, but he changed the business model based on where they were at the, that time. And he was running Interstate Dairy Queen Corporation. He had a 
he had the franchise rights to all the Dairy Queen stores on the interstate highway system. So he started pairing Stuckey's Mm -hmm. with Dairy Queen at a time when you really weren't co-branding. You didn't see Subway and Starbucks and Hardee's at a pilot travel plaza, for example. Nowadays, you see that everywhere. But he really was a pioneer in that respect. But his main business was Dairy Queen. That was the breadwinner. That was what paid the bills and brought in the revenue. And Stuckey's at that point was, frankly, a fading brand. So he went with what was really profitable. And that makes sense. And then my dad and his business partners retired about a decade ago when they sold their Dairy Queen to Warren Buffett, who owns American Dairy Queen. And so for the past 10 years, Stuckey's has been, frankly, floundering with the skeleton crew and just a handful of stores, none of which are corporate owned, a distribution center and a sad website at the time. <laughs> I hate to say. <laughs> so I just felt like I had to do this. This was this was my shot to bring the family business back around. And you talk, this, this show is all about storytelling. So I want to focus on that because it is so integral to Stuckey's and our comeback. I, I love storytelling and that's what I've done throughout my life. Even though I've had different careers, that's the magic of storytelling is you can apply it to anything. And if you're able to apply storytelling, I think you can be a success at whatever endeavor you have. I was able to get elected in politics because I could talk to people and relate to people. I was able to try cases and win jury verdicts because I learned how to be persuasive and stand up for the underdog, which is something I've always believed in. Definitely in my environmental battles, I was an environmental lawyer for the environment side, not the corporate side. So I'm, I knew how to tell a story and I knew the story of Stuckey's and I knew nobody else would love this brand as much as I do. And other than my dad who and my aunt, who thankfully are still very much alive and advising me, but I knew I love this brand and it needed to be revived. And it was part of the whole road trip renaissance, in my opinion, which is really coming back around. So that's why I did it. And I, I have no regrets. In fact, I'm grateful every day for having made that decision. So let's think of the reviving, your reviving of the Stuckey's brand as a road trip. When did you kick off this road trip? Was it like November 2019? Do I have that right when you bought the brand? It That's correct. And it was a bit of an evolution. I took a page from my playbook in, being pol- in politics. When you first decide you're going to run for office or if you're running for re-election, the, the initial step is you go on a listening tour and you make sure you're gathering as much information as possible. Certainly you have an idea of what your strategy and your vision is, but you want to have it shaped by boots on the ground, learning about what's happening in the field. And so I applied that to Stuckey's and I decided I'm going to go tour every single Stuckey's. And there were 20 brick and mortar stores, like I said earlier, but there were also some 40 plus Stuckey's Express stores that my dad had created, which were stores within a store. So all total, there were like 65 locations for me to visit. And I set about doing it. Of course, COVID hit, so that slowed me down some. But I realized on the journey that it wasn't just about visiting Stuckey's and checking out whether the restrooms were clean and the stores were stuck, the shelves were stocked and meeting the managers. It was about the journey. And in a way, it played in my favor that we only had a handful of locations because there would be a day of driving between locations. And while I was taking those long car trips, I started to pull over and see the world's largest belt buckle and (laughs) the goofy golf course and stayed at the Wigwam Village. And I realized I know it sounds kind of hokey. It's not the destination, it's the journey, but it truly is. And I started posting online my stories of going to all these wonderful small town places and exploring America and taking the back roads and sharing that. And people were responding. And that's when you know you're telling a good story. I think so often we get uh, deceived with social media and we look for what I call vanity metrics. How many likes do I get? It's really 
how much engagement do I get and how am I forming a relationship with people? And that's what was starting to happen. So I was less interested in getting a thousand likes. I'd much rather have 20 really solid comments from people who are sharing their stories. Oh my God, I went to Quartzsite too. Did you see the high jolly grape? Wasn't that the best? Hey, my wife loves the date shakes. What about you? Like, that's what I'm going for. And that's and, magical. And it's organic, that's isn't it? Brand back. Yeah, I mean, and it's organic because you just happened into it on the road trip and started checking in on all these different yes. places and people started picking up on that. But also in the road trip and as much time as you spent on the road, what did it tell you about your business of Stuckey's? I mean, I imagine you probably had some revelation out in the middle of the Arizona desert at some point after visiting many, many stops and had an aha moment on how you might be able to continue turning around the brand. It's a combination of how you inform your strategy. I definitely pay attention to financial reports. And that's the challenge of being in business is you may come into it, whether you're building a business fresh or you're rebuilding a, a business. And in many respects, I think rebuilding a business is much harder because you have to take what you get. And if I were to start the company in you, I'd have just corporate owned stores. I wouldn't have these franchise operations that frankly are, are lacking in consistency. But when you're running a business, you have to have your strategy strategy driven in part by, well, in large part, because you, you can only grow if you have cash. So you have to look at the financials and you have to understand what is driving your revenue. So I started putting in buckets. Where's our money coming from? Like I said earlier, 10% of our revenue now is coming from online. Well, 80% of our revenue comes from sale of our products, not our franchise fees. And I quickly realized if I was to bring this company back, I had to start selling product and I had to start selling the best product I can possibly make or else we couldn't survive. We sell sweets and confections. And if you're in that industry within a health conscious world, the only way you're going to succeed is to have it be absolutely delicious because when people are going to want to take an indulgence, they want to make it worthwhile and they want to make it the best. So that's why I bought this manufacturing facility. And we're driving our revenue through the sale of our profit. And I'm telling the story of the road trip. And as I tell the story of the road trip, people are organically, like we said earlier, it's, this is an organic process in part. They are, they are buying our product. And so partially that was going on the road and seeing that I can tell the story of the road trip. And that's going to sell the brand just as much as the stores are. And the stores are selling our products. So don't get me wrong. The stores are, are a key part of our strategy. But when I started out, I was thinking the stores are 90% of our strategy. And it's not. It's part of it. And it's coupled with having strong retail partners that can also sell our product and bring that road trip experience to a much wider audience by expanding where we can have our product available in the marketplace. Were you surprised at all about the nostalgia around the Stuckey's brand and the reaction you got on LinkedIn, which, you know, is a decidedly business platform. And even though you are talking about the Stuckey's brand there, your stories don't come off necessarily as business oriented. It's really more of kind of a trip through the past of the brand and where you're taking it. They're not business oriented at all, which absolutely did surprise me. I think it's in part a product of the time because with COVID, so many people are feeling isolated and craving connections and we're not having these in-person conferences and meetings. And so the business community is turning to LinkedIn to make those connections. I think had it been more normal times when people were socializing as we were before COVID, they, they wouldn't be turning to LinkedIn as much. And I was posting a lot of the nostalgia stuff, but I was posting it on Facebook because I thought that's the market for nostalgia is Facebook. And LinkedIn, I'm going to do business. And so I was posting these businessy, I, I, I can't even know how to describe them. They weren't stories. They were just uh, narratives or, you know, here's 
here's my plan for moving Stucky's board. And it was a little dry. And then I think one day I just decided to, I was rushed and I did a cross post like, all right, so I'm going to put on on LinkedIn what I put on Facebook. And then there was all this engagement and all these people were messaging me and telling me stories. So, you know, that adage, if you do something and it's working, then do more of it, double down. So I started doing more of it. And initially I'd been posting on LinkedIn three times a week. I started posting every day. And now I post at least once a day, something personal. And then I also have started sharing other people's stories because I really do want to have that relationship. So I'm paying attention to who's engaging with me, but also strategically, who do I want to engage with? Gee, I would love to have Stucky's products and tractor supply. So I need to start following tractor supply and commenting on their posts and engaging their leadership. So I'm trying to get more strategic and focused, but still really focusing on the storytelling aspect. And the sales will come from that. You know, I don't think it has to be so business focused. I think the business is going to happen as you are sharing what makes this brand special. Yeah. You got trolled a little bit last week. I don't know if you saw that or not. <clears throat> and I can't remember which post you you had put in. You did. And someone said, oh, it's, you know, Stephanie, these stories are great, but I think you're oversharing here yeah. on LinkedIn. And so oh, then I, I wrote. That. I did see that. Yeah. And I responded to the guy and I just said, you know, honestly, LinkedIn has become such a spam fest that I just find these very refreshing because all she is doing is talking about her family business and demonstrating it in action. And then I had a lot of people respond to mine too, you know, in your favor. But I thought that was interesting. Here was someone pushing back on you thinking you were you were sharing too much or posting too often. Do you ever feel that way? Well, I, I'm a big fan of Seth Godin's. Do you read his marketing oh, yeah. books? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he talks about having a tribe and how critical that is in a business that you don't necessarily need to be all things to all people. You just need to have a core following of loyal brand followers. And that's what I'm after. So not everyone is going to love Stuckies. That I do remember that post. That guy clearly is not part of the Stuckies tribe. That's okay. <laughs> right. That's actually what the the uh, block button is for. Like you don't have to follow me and you don't have to read my post and that's okay. Uh, I, I learned a long time ago to have thick skin. I learned that as a public defender representing some pretty unpopular clients. And then I learned it in politics. I have been called every name in the book in politics. So I just shake it off. I mean, you, for every negative comment I've gotten, I, I've had 50 positive ones that are so encouraging. And I just focus on the goodwill and the good intent of the people out there who are in our tribe and try to make sure that I'm offering them something of value. Like I said, I want it to be a relationship and I want to make sure we're being reciprocal. Yeah. What do you think are some of the mistakes maybe businesses make in their storytelling or the lack thereof? Well, I think that's just it. It's the lack thereof. I've talked to some other business owners and they've asked me for advice on storytelling and they've said, well, we don't have a story. Actually, you do. Everyone has a story. And I think that's interesting. I, I'm now obsessed with reading biographies and autobiographies of business leaders. I've read the the biography of Netflix, This Will Never Work. I just finished Bill Knight's book, Shoe Dog, The Story of Nike. I reread Sam Walton's book, Made in America. I read the Ray Kroc biography, Grinding It Out. And I'm looking forward to I need to find one written about a female CEO. There's got to be a few. Lately, they just all the bestsellers that I've been picking have been about male CEOs. But the point is, you all have a story, and they're all interesting, and you don't have to be a Nike or a Netflix to have something of value. And it just has to be authentic. And my stories are all from our family archives. Now, granted, I have 80 years of them, but 
a lot of these stories I've been discovering for the first time. My my first three months of running Stuckies, I spent every evening poring over articles about my grandfather and writing them down and condensing them and putting them in a timeline. And there was he came back to life for me. I was 12 when he died. And there are all these great things about him that I never knew. And I think they don't need to die in an archive in a box somewhere. They need to be shared. Like how Stuckey's was founded with the help of an African-American farmhand who drove around the countryside with my grandfather and helped him haul pecan bags. And they would be so tired at the end of working these all night shifts that they would sleep on the bags together in the back of the truck. And, and he, that man, John King remained with my grandfather and working for Stuckey's his entire life. There was a great photo of them in the 25th anniversary edition of Stuckey's. And I've actually connected with John King's family and thanked them for their role. And I said, well, we're we're not really profitable right now. This was like three months into it. And right now we're barely profitable. But I said, I, I want to thank you. And if we ever get to a point where we're more profitable, love to, you know, engage you more in the company and just let you know how much I appreciate that you were there at the beginning. So that's just one of the many stories I shared that and got a, a lot of great reaction, especially from African-Americans who said, There's so many white entrepreneurs, especially of that era in the Deep South, that were aided by Black Americans, and that's never been acknowledged. So that's just one of the many stories. But I think those those tales need to be told. Absolutely. And I've heard this from a number of people, that living in the Deep South gives you a decided storytelling advantage in that many, many people think that folks from the Deep South are just naturally good storytellers. Do you think that is the case? Or did you grow up in a storytelling family that taught you these techniques? Or is it just completely intuitive for you? I grew up in a storytelling family. My mom would tell stories every night. And I grew up reading Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor. My mom was an English teacher, and she is rabid about Southern fiction especially. And so I most definitely grew up reading all sorts of Southern stories, really focused on the South. I do think it's something really special about our heritage in the Deep South that we do sit around and tell stories. And we don't, I think I read this on a cocktail (laughs) napkin, but it was something like in the South, we don't hide our relatives in the, in the attic. We put them on the front porch and display them for all the world to see, you know, our eccentric great aunt Pearl. I mean, we, we share those stories. We celebrate the oddities of our family and it's just part of who we are. It's in our DNA. Uh, So yeah, I do think there's something maybe in the red clay soil that, just propagates this natural love of weaving a yarn and sharing it. And when you come across a business person, executive, whatever, anybody, I suppose, for that matter, saying, well, I don't really have a story to tell, what do you tell them? How do you teach them or where do you send them to look for their own story? Well, usually those folks are just like, we're not telling stories. That's not us. So they're not really looking for advice. I would just say, read fiction and read nonfiction that's told well and find your inner voice and you just develop it by practicing. And you, any great writer is disciplined and you, I get up every morning and I drink a cup of coffee and maybe two cups of coffee and I write what's in my heart. I come up with my post every morning and maybe I should be more strategic. And I do have a, I do have a written marketing strategy and a branding and communications plan. And I do have a calendar that has important dates that I should make sure I mention. So I I mean, there is a structure to it, but I don't want to be so structured that I'm, I'm suffocating creativity And so Mm -hmm. I really, it's just to have that space to think and really find what has meaning to you that day. And a lot of times it's informed by what's happening in the world. That's why I do have Hootsuite. I do have programmed posts just to make sure that there's a cadence and we're keeping up with 
engagement. But for me, I would much rather have authentic posts that really come from the heart than just bam, 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 every day I'm going to post five times and just put stuff out there. So I'm posting, you know, I think it's, it's important just to really find your voice. But if someone who doesn't really, you know, who says, I don't have a story, then I don't know. Like, <laughs> 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 well, well, case in point I'm here. I'm sorry, you know, I'll, I'll crush the competition. I definitely yeah. have a competitive side. Good, you don't have a story? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I you do, get up, and I'm going to keep that on mine. <laughs> you have your cup of coffee. You haven't really strategized it. You write kind of what comes to mind, and you, you're very successful, obviously, on LinkedIn. I'm looking at the post with you sitting next to the Colonel, Colonel Sanders, and I you're, I believe, you're in Missouri. Meridian, Missouri, or Mississippi, Mississippi, Mississippi. And you were, you just wrote a very brief post here about why you admire Colonel Sanders. And by the way, I didn't realize the founder of Wendy's came through there. Dave Thomas, I did not know that he was a product of it until I read your post. Dave Thomas was mentored by Colonel Sanders. So many of these iconic brands, they all knew one another and they worked together. My grandfather was buddies with Kimmons Wilson, the founder of Holiday Inn. And he knew Truett Cathy. He knew Joe King. Uh, True Cathy is founder of Chick-fil-A. Joe King is one of the co-founders of Waffle House. So I love that. I love the stories of entrepreneurs. They're amazing to me. What set them apart? What made them create these incredible brands that built America? And here you are with this post, and this this was a point I was going to make. So you 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 drink, you have a cup of coffee or two. You write this post, you post it, and three thousand three hundred sixty nine likes later, with three hundred and nine comments. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal engagement for any brand, let alone you know the Stuckey's brand that you are resurrecting. So hats off to you. Thank you. It's really gratifying and. It's also just touching on something that people want to hear. And I think these founder stories are fascinating. And I like to know, I like to know the story. I like to know when I'm, I'm drinking a cup of tea right now. I like to know who, what's the story behind that tea bag? How is that company founded? What made them want to make tea? Why, why do tea bags have little things on them? And other products don't. Like that stuff is fascinating to me and it's all around us. And why aren't we talking about it? I was thinking about Tang this morning. Who invented Tang? Where did they come up with the name? Why did Tang get on the spaceships as the astronauts drink and not Kool-Aid? Yeah, I, I think about that stuff. And I think other people think about it too. And I share it. So you must be a big fan of the TV series, The Food That Built America then. I'm obsessed. With that show, I had to post about it and I'm going to keep posting. I posted about Reese's and Butterfinger this week. When are they going to have a Stuckey's episode for you guys? Right. I think I would literally pass out in a cold faint and would have to be revived with smelling salts if the History Channel called and said they were interested in Stuckey's. I just, I would be apoplectic. (laughs) I'm such a fan of Maybe after this episode, you might just get that call, Stephanie. Yes, make that happen, will you? <laughs> I would. I would be happy to do that. Um, so, what you you've got kind of three principles that you use in your storytelling? Three rules to be effective. Would you mind sharing those? So the three rules are authentic, interesting, and relevant. And authentic is it's got to be real, and it's got to be your story. Well, you it's got to be them your over voice. To me. So don't. Read and we can do a pickup here too, for that matter. It's, Authentic, interesting, it's just not going to come across as relatable. Relevant, obviously, you've got to have something that people can relate to. And I also really think relevant is measured by how much people engage and respond. Because if you if you tell something people want to hear, they're going to follow up and, and give you their thoughts. And then interesting, it's it's got to pique your curiosity. And so if you can meet those three rules, I, as you think about what you're going to put out there in the world, uh, look at, consider those rules. And, and I think as I'm scrolling through, what grabs my eye? 
And I really pay attention to, I scroll LinkedIn. I also do Instagram. I love Instagram has that save function where you can put things in a folder. And I really study what, what gets engagement from other people and why. And then I look and I don't copy the, the post, but I copy the ideas of how they structure it and how they go about it. And, you know, do they have good images? Are they evoking stories of famous entrepreneurs, for example? That seems to do really well. How do you tell it in a way that engages? So I, I really, I'm really a student. I, I read something really great that said, really good leaders are learn-it-alls. You're not a know-it-all, you're a learn-it-all. So you're always learning. I think that's brilliant. I love that. I read that on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> so you are very much of a student of storytelling and how you use it in your life and in your business. Did you ever think you would have this much success so early after taking over Stuckey's with the engagement you're getting on LinkedIn? Or is it just kind of come natural to who you are? I did not, but I'm ready for that success to be translated into even more sales. I will say it is translating into sales. In fact, the biggest leads that we've gotten that are we're about to close deals were a direct result of LinkedIn. I mean, these these new retail accounts reached out to me and said, I saw your LinkedIn post. I'm interested in doing business with you. So it is definitely leading to real life results. Uh, so, no, I didn't think it would happen, uh, but I'm just so grateful and really appreciate people who follow me. And if you are listening to this, please follow me. If you ask me to connect with you, I will not be able to because LinkedIn limits the number of people you can engage with. I just want to put that out because people will sometimes message me and almost seem hurt that I haven't accepted their request. It's not personal. Link, it's blame LinkedIn. It just won't happen. All right. So what's next for Stuckey's? What do you got in store for us for 2021 and beyond? Well, we are really doubling down on selling our product and making the most delicious pecan snacks and confections you have ever tasted. So my business partner and I will have our new product line out in mid-May. And along with it, we're going to have new merchandising, new displays, and everything is going to be branded or brand forward. And I posted that today. I called it merchandise manifesto. Maybe that's a little too high and lofty, but that's, I like the cadence and the, the alliteration of it. And I, I talk about how I'm trying to get away from us being this brand that frankly, over the years out of desperation, we've been selling whatever we can get this bargain basement prices, whether it's representing the road trip and the pecan and Southern hospitality or not. And so you're going to see us just double down on being a brand that reflects Southern hospitality and road trips and eating delicious pecan snacks while you're at it. That's what's in our future. So look for a lot of our product, look for new branding, and look for people getting back on the road and us being part of that road trip experience. Was there ever a time since you bought the company in November 2019 that you thought you were going to lose it? Oh, almost every day, <laughs> usually like 3 a.m. when I wake up in a cold sweat. We went from 10 people on the payroll to almost 100. We've rapidly expanded, but I'm trying to expand in a way that's thoughtful, that we can manage it with our resources financially and team wise. And so far, we're we're managing it very well and we're keeping pace and we got cash in the bank and I'm grateful for that. And uh, we're just going to keep on growing responsibly, thoughtfully, but we're growing. Well, congratulations on reviving a, a true American brand, whether you're in the Pacific Northwest or not. You did have that one store, I guess. Yeah. But I just seeing the reactions on LinkedIn that you're getting on Instagram, your brand and what your grandfather started back in 1937 has had really a tremendous impact on a lot of Americans. So, you know, congratulations and thank you for bringing back this brand, a great risk to you and your family, your finances and everything else. But it sounds like you're on the road to recovery. Sorry about that pun. Oh, no, I, I use that pun too. I think it's it's totally appropriate. And I'm just so grateful to everyone who's interested in our story, who's following our story, who's 
who's giving me their suggestions and their thoughts and their well wishes and sharing their stories of Stucky's. Like I just cannot express enough how much that means to me completely makes my day when somebody shares a Stucky story. It, it's just so gratifying. And I just can't thank you enough for letting me be part of your, your podcast and sharing this journey with you and your listeners. Oh, I'm honored. And my final question to you, Stephanie, when are you writing your book about C- being CEO? I'm writing it. It's actually not my, it's not Stephanie CEO. It's the story of Stucky's and it includes, yeah. I'm, my story is intertwined with it, but I'm working on that right now. We've got a book publisher, Arcadia Publishing, out of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. It's a wonderful uh, small publishing house, and it's going to be pictorial heavy. So if you've seen any of their books, there's tons of graphic images, and I really like them. And so I've, I've got to get that to them. Uh, so my goal is to have that to them shortly, six-month turnaround. So hopefully by the fall, we'll have a book out. Awesome. And then I'll go on a book road trip tour. <laughs> I look forward to it. If you And when you come back through Arizona onto Quartzsite, please give me a call. We'll meet you out there and have a date shake together. I would love that. Quartzsite is beautiful. If those of you who have not been there, it's absolute must stop and see the movie Nomad Land, which was filmed in part there. It's, it's an incredible, special place. Oh, and what about that grave site that's yeah. just off the Stucky <laughs> store there? Can you give our listeners a quick little insight on what that's all about? It's- Classic roadside Americana. I love this story. Hi Jolly was an actual man. He's from India. He's recruited by the U.S. Army to come to the U.S. and train a special brigade of camel riders who would travel, traverse the American desert as this elite force. And he did that. And it was successful. And for whatever reason, I guess it just didn't fit with the Army's traditional mode of operating. They did away with the Camel Brigade. High Jolly went on to be a very successful businessman. This was in the late 1800s when he came to the U.S. and then early 1900s when he converted to being a businessman. He married an American. He became an American. He had a family. He was very successful. And he retired and died in Quartzsite. And so right off the interstate highway, right at the exit, there's a monument to High Jolly. And there's a camel statue. And there's a wonderful plaque. And when I was there, I I saw some folks pull over at a nearby souvenir stand. And I called them all over. And I said, do you all know the story of High Jolly? I got like six people to come over and see it. We had this whole conversation about what a cool story it was. So I should share his story on LinkedIn because I think it's fascinating. And he was a great businessman. So that's an entrepreneur story right there. Oh, you got to do it. You got it. I'm going to keep an eye out for it. And now. it's the immigrant story. Like we are a country of yeah. immigrants and we should celebrate these stories. Whether you were an immigrant like the Stuckies were, we came over to this country in the early 1800s, or you were an immigrant who came over Five years ago, there's so many wonderful stories like that. And so I should share the High Jolly story. And it's a roadside story. That's what's so great about it. Absolutely. And all, there's all these little hidden gems all over the country, aren't there? Everywhere. It's amazing. Yeah. Just have to look for them. They're there. Well, you're a gem, Stephanie. And thank you so much for being here on the Business of Story. I really have enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you, Park. <laughs> Take a Stucky stop, make a Stucky stop, it's the highway stop with style. Take a Stucky stop, make a Stucky stop, take a five minute stretch, Mm -hmm. or browse for a while. Relax, take a Stucky Mm -hmm. stop, refresh, take a Stucky stop, review, relax, take a Stucky Mm -hmm. stop, refresh, take a Stucky stop, review. And thank you all for listening to this edition. Whether you are a Stuckies fan, whether it's been in your family or you're brand new to it, check it out. Follow Stephanie Stuckey on LinkedIn if you really want to see fabulous brand and business storytelling at work. Hers is a model to it. And I just think she could probably take all of those posts and she's got a book right there. Very, very fun read. And it really gives you the sense of the heart of the company is very much of a purpose-driven brand. So 
Um, and if you like what you hear, heard here, please share it with your friends, family, and colleagues, maybe over a date shake or not. And if I can uh, be a service to you, check me out over at businessofstory.com. I can help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And as Stephanie said earlier, I can even help you find your story because it's in there. All you got to do is unearth it. And until next week, when we will have another amazing story artist right here for you like Stephanie, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening. Take a sucky stop, make a sucky stop. Take a five minute stretch mm-hmm. or browse for a while. Relax. Take a sucky mm-hmm. stop. Refresh. Take a sucky stop.